that, um, I'm going to now actually introduce today's speaker. Uh, Michelle Rivard um, is with us today. I hope I'm saying is your name correctly. Um, and again, please keep yourselves on mute if you are um, while we're during the presentation and so that we can hear each other and not background noise. So I um, just lost the... Um, so Michelle is a licensed independent clinical social worker with over 30 years experience. She's employed by the Department of Veterans Affairs as the Community and Engagement Partnership Coordinator. She works in 22 West Virginia counties providing education and outreach as well as working with coalitions to reach the 11 out of 17 veterans who die by suicide every day. She's held mental health and medical social work management, university community engagement and direct care positions in West Virginia, Tennessee, Alabama, Texas, Pennsylvania, Missouri, and Virginia. And when not working, Michelle spends time with family and friends, dog walking, riding her horse, reading, and flower gardening. So uh, thank you so much for joining us all today. And um, I'm going to turn it over you, to you as our speaker for today. Thank you so much, Mary. And um, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation, and um, as I said, I work as a community engagement and partnership coordinator at the Clarksburg VA, um, so I'm out and about in the community, 22 counties, and um, do a lot of education presentations, um, and I do um, outreach events, and also I do um, committees and coalitions. So if you have a, an education need, please get in touch with me. I'll gladly be a part of that. Or if you have a committee or coalition that you think it would be good for me to be a part of, please do reach out. So I do wanna, um, it's gonna be a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and share that and we'll go ahead and get started. So today I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm not sure it's moving. By the end of this training, what we'll do is we'll be able to describe um, the Veteran Health Administration's public health approach to suicide prevention, have a knowledge of veteran culture and enhancing alliance and effective work with veteran populations, be able to identify the impact of military service, um, how it can be physically, psychologically, socially, vocationally affected, and have knowledge of best practices to assist veterans in civilian readjustment. So the topic today was um, assisting veterans and families in community reintegration. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, if, you if you do have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll stop at any time um, and answer them. So I did wanna say thank you for this opportunity to talk today. It's an honor anytime that I can talk about veterans and the work that I do. A little bit about what I do. Again, I'm part of the VA suicide prevention team. I do education, I do outreach, and I build and join coalitions. So if you have any of those needs in the work that you do, please reach out. I'm more than willing to come talk to you or your group um, about veterans or about suicide prevention, about mental health, um, any outreach events that you have. I can come set up a table. And um, I am always looking for committees and coalitions to join. This um, slide is a picture of the VA, actually. And again, my role is to reach the 11 of 70 veterans who die by suicide each day and may or may not be engaged in VA care. So 65% of veterans who die by suicide either choose not to use the VA or do not qualify for VA services. So that's a big chunk of veterans that um, we don't reach through the VA. And my job is a national job. Anywhere that you go in the United States right now, you're gonna have a community engagement and partnership coordinator at every VA. So if you happen to move or relocate and want to reach somebody, there is somebody in my position. The picture on this screen is actually the um, Clarksburg VA. So you haven't, if you haven't been there, that's what it looks like. And you actually pull up around that circle and that's the front door. The tent isn't there anymore. That was the tent that was used for the um, COVID screenings. So it's kind of an older picture. And suicide prevention has changed at the VA. And I think that everyone is um, doing things a little bit differently today. But um, suicide prevention used to be more clinically based where people said we're gonna reach people after they, um, after they attempt suicide, after they have a suicide attempt, after they become suicidal. So we do still have a clinical foundation within the VA. We have a team of people who work in our mental health clinic. It's all evidence-based at this point. We do things virtually, we do things in person. And then we have the Veterans Crisis Line, which is 988. If you don't know that number, write it down in big letter somewhere big number somewhere, 988 is how anyone who's suicidal 
hospital or have a mental health needs can reach somebody at this point in time. If it's not in your phone, put it in your phone, but um, please let everybody know that that's the, the number. So what the VA did was they took my position, they have me out in the community covering 22 counties. I combine with a clinical basis, and then we have the full public health approach to suicide prevention. And how has that worked? What's happened over time, as you can see, suicides within the VA or veteran suicides peaked in about 2017 with 6,761. And what's happened since then when the public health model came in is the number started declining. And then the last number that we have at the VA is down to 6,146, and that was from 2020. So the numbers are going down with the public health approach, with people like me going to the community saying, hey, you don't wanna use the VA, you don't qualify for the VA, let me talk with you about some other agencies who might be able to help you. Um, we... Michelle, before you move on, there's actually a quick question in the chat. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if you covered this yet or not, but why would a veteran not qualify for VA services? Um, veterans don't qualify for VA for a lot of reasons. And the one thing, if you're not sure if a veteran qualifies or if they don't know, you call our main number, 304-623-3461, and you hit four, and that gets you in the enrollment office. And the enrollment office will go through that specific veteran with you. Um, the veteran's got to, of course, be a part of it. You can't do it for the veteran, but um, they can go through that veteran and find out if that veteran does qualify or not. So again, the main VA number, 304-623-3461, hit the four. If you don't remember that and you have my PowerPoint, the number on the front is my cell phone number, my work cell. So you can text me or call me at that number or send me an email and I'll get you in touch with enrollment. Um, one of the main reasons people don't qualify is they may not have served long enough. Their income may be too high. My dad was a draftee in the Korean War and never qualified for VA benefits because he um, his income was too high after he got out of the military. Um, the other thing that a lot of veterans don't realize or people don't always realize is that service connection, when you have something that happens to you in the military that can be called service connection, you would go through um, an evaluation process through um, an organization that kind of works with the VA. And what they do then is decide if that's a service-connected condition, even if you can't receive VA services for other things, you can receive VA services for that service connection. So a big one for veterans is hearing loss. A lot of veterans have hearing loss from, from being in the military. You're around loud machinery, you're allowed around guns, you're around explosions. So you can a lot of times get 10% service connection for hearing. So let's say you don't qualify for anything else with the VA, those $5,000 hearing aids will be provided for you by the VA. So if a veteran comes to you and says, I don't qualify for the VA, hey, let's call enrollment. Let's see if we can find out if we can find a way for you to qualify, or at least look into whether you do. Some veterans who didn't qualify in the past qualify now. So that's also shifted over time. And a veteran 20 years ago who said that it won't qualify may qualify today because there have been changes. So there's, I don't know if you want, there's one more question in the chat okay. and do you want me to just pop That's in the chat or do you want to go? Okay. So um, is the decrease in suicide rates related to public health resources changing or is it impacted by decreases in combat exposure too? I would say that decrease in suicide to me, and again, I'm talking from my own experience as a mental health worker for over 30 years and six years with the VA. I think that the public health model has made a huge difference because now we're helping veterans who don't qualify for VA services or don't want to use the VA to connect. And I think that becoming more evidence-based has made a difference. And I think having the vet crisis line has made a difference. Um, and also all the, um, the services that we do by phone and by um, um, teams, not by, um, we don't use Zoom, but the Zoom kind of things allows us to reach more veterans. So, and I think the stigma has gone down the amount of, like a lot of times, older veterans, especially um, Korean War, um, before Vietnam, Korean War, World War II, and a lot of Vietnam veterans, there was a lot of stigma attached to reaching out for mental health services. And some of that's declined. So there are a lot more people getting interventions before they die by suicide, in my mind. If you're gonna work with veterans, this next screen is kind of like my little, um, it's my little bio. But one of the questions you're gonna be asked by veterans and one of the questions you should be asking yourself is, 
Why? Why do I want to work with veterans? And that John Maxwell quote is one of my favorites. People don't care what you know until they know how much you care. So veterans are going to say, why do you care about working with me? And that's a lot of different populations will say the same thing. So I, a lot of times, will start out and talk about how I started my career in Virginia Beach, working with retired military and military families. I talk about the fact that my investment is because I worked in three VAs in Huntsville, Alabama, Nashville, Tennessee, Clarksburg, um, West Virginia. I talk about how in my mid-20s, I actually became primary caregiver for somebody with acute PTSD at an age when that was extremely difficult to do. But if I have somebody suffering from PTSD and I bring that up, it helps them connect with me. I talk about the fact that I was married for 22 years to a Navy nuclear submariner and spent 22 years in veteran, um, a lot of veteran social events. Father was a Korean War draftees. Father-in-law was a World War II Purple Heart recipient. So when you think about working with veterans, think about right now while you're sitting there during this presentation, what's your investment? If a veteran says to you, why do you want to work with me? Why do you care about me? Why do you? And everybody's answer is going to be a little bit different, but that's kind of my answer. Um, the other thing I always bring up, and this has absolutely nothing to do with the presentation, but please take care of yourself before you take care of others. In every aspect or any part of social work that you're going to be involved in, there's a lot of stress and a lot of taking care of others, a lot of emotional stuff. So um, it's really good to have your own outlets, you know. And my picture's there. This is my flower garden. This is my horse nugget. That's my son who's 23 now. I'm real connected to my family. And that's usually how you see him, either waving hello or waving goodbye, because he's 23, he's always coming and going. My two dogs, I spend a lot of time walking them. And this is my dad, who is a Korean War veteran. Insight into military culture goes a long way in building alliances and successfully helping a veteran reconnect. So we're going to talk some about that. And this is another quote that came from a wise veteran. A common transition challenge is relating to people that have no idea to understand or empathize what military personnel have experienced. So if I'm gonna work with veterans, the veterans want to know, what do you know about me? Or again, how are you gonna connect with me? Um, and if you look just, I use a lot of pictures. And if you look at this picture, you know, um, once you work with veterans, you kind of tune, tune into some of this. He's got the post 174 on that, which is probably either VFW or American Legion. He's got a jacket on, which means their leather jacket. There's a good possibility he's involved with a veteran motorcycle organization. And that wall, I'm not too sure exactly what it is he's looking at, but if you haven't been to Vietnam Veteran Memorial Wall in DC, I highly recommend that. It, it really kicks your butt. It's a very emotional place to be. So that's kind of a good thing to do. If you wanna acclimate yourself to veterans, go to DC, walk around the memorials, but the Vietnam Memorial um, is one that really, it stops you in your tracks, has a lot of impact. So just a cool thing. Um, and how do you learn about veterans? Um, veterans, a lot of times, military people don't wanna talk about the, the, the war experiences, but you can talk to veterans about where were you deployed? Where were you stationed? What was your day-to-day -day life like? Um, you know, what was boot camp like? But, you know, it, if you're going to work with veterans, it's good to talk to them about that. Before you start that work or while you're doing that work, ask your own family members, ask your friends who you know are veterans. What was that experience like for you? Just so you get a feel, a flavor for what that would be like. I'm going to spend some time now. This is called Gone But Not Forgotten, and it's an actual story. And look at this picture while I'm talking. And um, if you don't do anything else, if you're going to multitask during the presentation, that's fine. Spend about five minutes just listening to this story because I think it helps you get um, in touch. This is a story that was actually written by um, Barbara Forsha is our medical center director and her daughter, when she was in eighth grade, interviewed um, a veteran and then wrote up this story. Um, it's since been tweaked by our suicide prevention coordinator at the VA who actually served for 25 years in the army as an EOD, um, disarmed bombs for a living. So this is kind of a veteran story. So I just like to spend a couple of minutes, sit back, look at the picture related to what I'm gonna say. So even if you're not listening to the rest of it, give me about five minutes and just listen. This is called Gone But Not Forgotten. Brian is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps with eight and a half years of service to our country. Coming from a long line of military families covering every branch of the service for four generations, he entered a Marine Corps delayed entry program at 16. He will tell you that 9-11 was the event in his life that solidified 
his reason to join. He endured three deployments in Iraq, serving in the role of an infantry mortarman. He told me that the worst thing he remembers is that good young men were dying over there. It was a tragedy to be taken so young. You think of how much good they could have done in society. Brian vowed that his comrades may be gone, but they would not be forgotten. Brian described some of his first deployment days as living out of power plant barracks with no hot water to shower with, no roof over their heads, or if there was a roof, it leaked. During his second deployment, he lived out in the open and slept in old schools or in the back of a truck. They bathed with baby wipes. During the winter, the temperature dropped to 40 degrees at night. In the summertime, it went as high as 120 degrees. They were required to carry 60 to 80 pounds of gear with them all day long, and they wore sappy plates in their jackets to prevent injury from shrapnel, which is fragments of a bombshell or other explosive parts that could cause injury. These sappy plates weighed an additional 30 pounds. So you could be carrying around an extra 140 pounds with you all day long. No amount of preparation readies you for war. Training is nothing like the real thing, Brian said. You are literally scared shitless. He shared that one has to always be sharp and thinking on your feet. You have rounds coming in all around you. Your survival skills kick in and you learn to react and think about it later. He told me, I had a very heavy responsibility on top of all that, to keep my Marines safe and bring them home. That is a huge expectation of a young man. Brian said that after seeing combat, you are changed forever. He said all the life events that you will take seriously, such as getting married, having a baby, buying a house, none of it is serious after seeing combat. All those other things seem so minuscule in comparison. Then Brian said, if none of that is bad enough, you come home and life has passed you by. Things are not the same. People are not the same. It's as if you're in a time warp and somehow you don't fit in anywhere. People do not understand you and you don't understand them. Life for you is so different and no one can understand where you have been, what you have seen, or what you have done. Your struggle with emotions of being a failure, getting out when your comrades are still in there, like you deserted them, feeling responsible for those you lost under your watch. But the best you can do is vow to yourself that their stories will not be untold and they will not be forgotten. Brian learned that war is devastating to the body, mind, and soul. Your fate is never really known. Will you live? Will you die? Will you come home and ever see your loved ones again? Will you ever be the same person having that experience? I learned that the value of what our servicemen and women do for us and for our freedom can never be repaid. Brian said that he saw the best in people during the worst and most inhumane of times. Brian shared an anecdotal story about children who are living in terrible conditions, and if you gave them the smallest of things, like a piece of candy, you would have thought you gave them pure gold. I could tell that the effects of the experience of war will be with Brian for a very long time, and that he experienced things that were very hard for him, things that threatened tears in the eyes of a grown man. The greatest thing I learned from Brian is that even though our men and women are gone, we must never forget them and what they have done for us. So next time you see a service member, thank them and appreciate them for what they do for us each and every day. Because while we sleep in our comfortable beds at night, Brian and his comrades are watching over us while sleeping in truck beds, living in very hot and cold conditions and dodging the next gunfire or explosive that may take their life. So that's our gone but not forgotten story. We're gonna go on now a little bit about military, again, military culture. And when you're working with military, um, each branch of the surface is called something different. If you're working with somebody from the army, they're a soldier. If they're from the National Guard, they're a soldier or airman, reservist, military reserve force. Marines are called Marines, Navy is called sailors, Air Force is called airmen, Coast, uh, Coast Guardsmen are called Coasties. Around here, we work, work primarily with Marines and with soldiers because this part of the United States is mostly Army and Marines. When I was in Virginia Beach, it was almost all sailors. And again, look at these pictures as we're going through this. What's it really like to be deployed? That story we just listened to, it's probably 100 degrees out there. Think about what you wear outside when it's 100 degrees and how long you stay outside. These people, these are guys, but it's men and women, are in a helmet that weighs a couple of pounds and it's insulated, so it's hot. They're wearing 
long sleeve shirts, long sleeve pants, heavy vests over top of that and leather boots. And it's a hundred degrees. And they're not going inside an air conditioning. They're going from outside an air conditioning during the day to a tent probably at night that's not air conditioned. And if you look at this truck, when the guys tell you or women tell you that their backs hurt and their knees hurt, that's a metal on metal truck. There's no shocks in that thing. They're sitting on a metal seat inside a medical metal vehicle with a road that looks like that. And every time they hit a bump, it's jamming their back. And they're not too concerned about it because they're really worried about whether there's a bomb up the road that they're gonna run over with that truck. When you're working with military people, if you wanna bond with someone from the army, ask them what their MOS is. They're gonna come back with letters and numbers because they never use letters in the military so that they're clear they use like the, um, the Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. So somebody's gonna come back, what's your MOS? They're gonna say 31 Bravo. You're not gonna know what that means, just like I don't, because what I know about the military I got from stories, ask them what that is. But that automatically, immediately, usually guys will smile, and women, if you say, what's your MOS? And that's somebody who's in the Marines or the Army. If they're a sailor, you're asking them what their rating is. And again, look at this picture and then think about what that would be like all day. Oh, I have to get on the right screen. That guy's carrying probably 100 pounds on him. And he's doing that all day. If you're a woman in the military, you carry the same pack. So you may be a 100 pound woman, you're carrying a 100 pound pack. And the other thing that women talk about is the fact that those packs are fitted for men and they don't fit women's bodies too well. So think about that as, you're, as we're going through some of these, um, what the pictures look like. Um, if you're gonna work with military people, um, I used to have the maps up in my office. My office looked like it's a beautiful mine because I would slap all this stuff up there. But if you ask someone in the Army or the Marines um, where, where they were stationed, they're going to um, they're gonna give you a base. They're not going to give you a town. And then you just ask them, oh, you know, I was in Fort Hood. A lot of the guys around here, women that I work with here in West Virginia, say Fort Hood, Fort Bliss, Fort Benning comes up. Fort Campbell is actually where I was last, and that's right outside Nashville. So the men and women I was working with in Fort in um, Nashville were actually mostly coming out of Fort Campbell because it was actually, you know, like 10 miles away. Um, if you're going to work with someone in the Navy, um, the sailors, and you ask them where they were stationed, they usually come up with towns. And if you notice, um, most of the Navy bases, and this is just a map of some of them, but most of the Navy bases are along the coast, which is what you would expect because they're going to be on ships and submarines. Um, when people talk about deployments or when you're going to talk with someone about deployment, please um, have a map or at least know where these countries are because these people are stationed there. They live there for months and months on end. And when you think of OEF, I, OIF, which are two, our two most recent um, wars that, that we had guys deployed to, they were fought in Afghanistan, which is here, and Iraq, which is here. And we think about those as just big sand countries. But if you think about it, Afghanistan and Iraq are as far apart as, let's say, Vermont and Florida, or as far apart as West Virginia and Colorado. And think about between those places, how many different climates you go through, what the terrain looks like between those places, what kind of people you run across, different people in Vermont than you find in Florida, different people in Colorado than you find in Illinois than you find in West Virginia. So when you think about that, and we all speak the same language, we are primarily from the same religious groups. These groups, on the other hand, you're talking different cultures, different religions, different languages. So when you think about these different countries, they're not all just the same clump and sand country, different, different countries. So when you talk to the veterans, ask them, where were you deployed? What was it like there? Vietnam is the same way. Vietnam, um, mostly guys that I work with from Vietnam, they love to talk about where they were deployed, not what they did, but what was it like to be in Vietnam? Um, these are my military culture things that I live by, things that you should think about. If you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. If you're gonna meet with somebody who is in the military for a good amount of time, and you wanna start off on the wrong foot, show up five minutes late for that appointment. They're gonna have been sitting there for 10 or 15 minutes, and they're gonna be expecting you to come out on time for that appointment. And if you don't, just explain to them what happened that you didn't. 
If you're one of these people who is usually 10 minutes late for every appointment, not the thing to do with military personnel typically. Use titles and last names. I've done uh, mental health work for about 30 years. Um, typically in mental health work, you do last, you do first names, get familiar with people. Military people I found, veterans prefer last name and titles. Um, Mr. So-and-so, Ms. So-and-so. I mean, that's just something, again, it was kind of an interesting transition because that's just something I automatically began to do over time. I'm not too sure what that's about, um, but it is something that that's worked for me. Respect for flag and national anthem, very important for military people. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time, I don't think, telling my story so we don't run out of time. But again, I was married to a veteran for a long period of time um, and we had season tickets to football games, the national football teams um, to the games. And there was nothing worse than when we stood up for the flag and the national anthem if someone around us didn't. Um, we play the national anthem at the VA in the mornings. And the guys that are sitting there and women who are sitting there waiting to be seen for appointments, the expectation is when that national anthem is played, all of the staff stop what they're doing and look towards where the music is being played or towards the flag if they can find one. Very important in military culture. Expect and accept cursing, communicate matter-of-factly. There's gonna be joking, there's gonna be poking fun and order and rank um, are important typically to people in the military. You know, who is your boss? Who's your boss's boss? And it's just kind of a rank. It's something, it's just the way that they've organized their worlds. These um, actually are the medals that were my father-in-law's World War II medals. And the background is my mother-in-law's um, kitchen table. It was at least 50 years after he was in the military. He'd been long dead. And we were talking about his veteran service and she had these all tucked away neatly and laid them out on the kitchen table and talked to us about them. So kind of a neat thing. People usually are very um, proud of the medals that they have and they do tend to have them tucked away somewhere. I'm gonna kind of go through this real fast. This is on the PDF, which is in the um, chat box. You can pull it up if you want to. The one thing that you should know about is the DD-214, if you don't, that's the golden ticket for someone who's in the military, a veteran. If someone wants to use VA services, if they want to do anything that will have to do with their veteran status, they need a DD-214. If you don't know how to find a DD-214 or you don't know if they qualify again for VA, get in touch with our enrollment office. And they have these magic ways of finding people's DD-214s. My father just died recently in the last couple of months. And Korean War veteran, and my brother's the um, executor for his estate, and had to have my dad's DD-214 for something. So he, my dad, always kept track of that thing, and it was sitting in a file. But if someone you know has been in the military and they don't have their DD-214, it'd be a good thing for you to help them get if you have an opportunity to do that. Um, these are again, um, oh, I do want to go back to this one and look at this picture. And we talked, um, we haven't talked so much about, but hearing loss is, is um, across universal to most veterans or a lot of military personnel. And this is kind of a perfect example. This is a Vietnam picture. And when things go off and explode, you're not going to be looking for earplugs. It's too late. So here's a bunch of guys sitting there putting their fingers in their ears because there's explosions going off around them. This is another good one. Again, things are exploding and look at this picture and look at what they're wearing. Again, it's probably a hundred degrees outside. Those guns that they're carrying on their shoulders are about five pounds each maybe. The helmet's about three pounds. They're in full garb with leather boots and it's a hundred degrees outside. And look at how close that explosion is. So this is a day-to-day -day life for people in the military who are deployed. Um, with these, so one thing guys are going to talk about in women is um, being inside or outside the wire, which just means whether you're on the base or off the base. And I can tell you that guys that are deployed now, women who are deployed um, inside the wire, people get shot and killed inside the wire. You're not safe because you're on the base when you're deployed. There's rounds going off all around you. And I've heard more than one veteran story about someone, how, you know, mechanic was working on um, a Jeep-like thing inside the wire and a sniper shot one of the guys that was working with them. So they had to go out while they were still under fire and drag him behind another vehicle to safety. So inside the wire is not as safe as you would think it would be. This is again, five things, something to read on your own, five things um, military veterans want you to know, but that would be something if you wanna get kind of a good 
quick snapshot of different things that um, veterans would want you to know. That would be a good thing to kind of read, keep up in your office if you're working with a lot of veterans. We talked again about um, military service effects on community and reintegration. The one thing is a lot of times veterans can't hear. If they can't hear, they don't know what you're saying to help them reintegrate. So be sensitive to that and think about that. Make sure you turn towards a veteran when you're working with them. Make sure you're kind of enunciating so that they can hear and understand what you're saying. Don't assume they can hear just because they're 22 years old. There's a possibility one ear's shot out, both ears are shot up. You know, you don't know. Chronic pain is from all eras, and a lot of that has to do with the things that we talked about. You know, um, all that gear that they're carrying, they don't stop a helicopter when they take you during deployment. They get close to the ground, you jump, and the helicopter keeps going so it doesn't get shot at or shot out. So these guys have now, I'm women, 50 pounds, 70 pounds, 100 pounds of pack on them. The helicopter gets close to the ground and is still moving forward and they're jumping out. And thinking about yourself jumping out of the back of the pickups truck with nothing or what it would be like, you know, just to jump a small distance with nothing. Then think about what that would do to your knees and your back and your shoulders and everything else if you're doing that um, while a vehicle's moving. Physical handicaps are from all eras. Vietnam veterans have a lot of heart problems from Agent Orange, a lot of nerve conditions like Parkinson's and a lot of cancers. The OEF, OIF Gulf War, um, it's a lot of um, smoke inhalation and a lot of chemicals. So these guys are coming back in women with breathing issues and sinus issues. And this picture I like to use, especially uh, it's, it really applies to today. But um, this is from the Gulf War probably because that was supposed to be a chemical war. So these guys were deployed and they wore that mask in 100 degree weather the whole time they were outside. And I like to talk about it today because you know what it was like for you to wear a mask during COVID. You were inside in air conditioning. You had that mask on covering nothing but your nose and your mouth. And it was a little cloth mask. Imagine if that's what you were wearing eight, 10, 12 hours a day in a hundred degree heat. And you're trying to make sure nobody's shooting at you at the same time. And I think that you got a little peripheral vision issue going on there, but that kept them from having the chemical exposure they were concerned about. Military service effects on community reintegration. Um, some of the things that keep people alive in the military really are not helpful once you get back. Hypervigilance, um, how veterans stay alive when they're deployed is that they stay alive by always wondering whether they're gonna get blown up, whether they're gonna get shot. So when guys come back from the military or women, um, they don't want their backs to windows. They want to, what's the first thing you're told? Like social work 101 and mental health. Always put yourself between the door and the client you're working with. When you're working with a veteran, there's a fight for who's gonna be by that door. Because veterans will scan the room, they'll figure out where the exits are, they'll sit close enough to the exit that they can get out. They're not gonna put their back to the door or the window. And they're gonna be hypervigilant. They're in fight or flight or freeze mode constantly their adrenaline's flowing, they're hyped up, and that's what kept them alive. That's why they came home. Not sleeping is another thing. You know, when you're deployed, you're not sleeping because it's 24 hours a day, you're worried about something happening to you. Um, and the other thing that happens in the military, even if you're not deployed, my um, ex-husband was on fast attack nuclear subs. That one that was on the picture was the, um, was the USS Lapon, which is the one that he spent the most time on. But a fast attack nuclear sub is the length of a football field, half the width of a football field, and there's 90 to 100 guys on there. So picture 90 to 100 grown men. There are women on submarines now, but there weren't before. 90 to 100 people living for three to six months under the ocean with in 100, the length of a football field, half the width. So what that meant was they had a bunk that they shared with somebody else a lot of times. It's called hot racking. You don't even have your own bed. Your bed is 18 inches from the guy on top of you. They're stacked three high, you have 18 inches. You have that bed for 12 hours. The next guy has that bed. And you rotate whether you're doing days or nights. And when you're underneath the ocean like that, you don't know whether it's day or night. You know, you think about the 24 hour military clock because 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. look the same once you're under the ocean. Um, not working till the job is done is another thing that um, 
military people work till the job is done. And when you're in civilian world, you're expected to work nine to five, eight to four thirty. You leave things hanging. You come back the next day, and that's difficult for people in the military. Authoritative towards others, also part of the military, following orders and rigid structure, and not asking for help. So those are things common in the military um, that don't serve people all that well in today's world. Um, civilian world. And then again, effects on community reintegration. A lot of veterans are coming back with PTSD, anxiety, depression, and insomnia, which increases drug and alcohol use, and then thoughts of suicide are a piece of that. So always think in terms of when you're trying to reintegrate someone in the military, are those things that they have? Um, are there things that you need to work on in their mental health? This one, civilian world culture that can create veteran family community reintegration challenges, no clear chain of command. I think about my job, I was thinking about my job um, as I was writing this presentation, and I actually have two chains of command. I work for the VA in Clarksburg, so I have a boss at the VA in Clarksburg who has a boss and a boss and a boss there. So we have a chain of command within the VA. I also have a national position, which means I have a totally different chain of command that I have meetings with on a daily basis that is totally separate from the one that's at the Clarksburg VA. So they both give me different messages and it's my job to integrate those two messages so that I can succeed at the position that I'm in. When you're in the military, if you had two chains of command, you'd have two officers telling you what to do at the same time. That doesn't work. And I think a lot of our positions in civilian world are more like mine where the, there's not a clear chain of command. You have different people telling you different things that may actually not even always, um, they may conflict with each other sometimes. Um, civilian world is like structured. Food, clothing, and housing are not provided. When you think about the military and someone's enlisted in the military, they can eat on base, they can eat, uh, they can eat um, in the mess hall. If they um, choose to live on base or off base, they can go to the commissary, which is a military grocery store to shop at. Um, clothing is provided. When you're in the military, you have uniforms. You don't have to think about what to wear. And housing, if you think about someone in the military, they typically start out living in the barracks. They then live on base. And even once they get to military housing outside of not living on base, um, when you move to like a, you get um, changed to a new location, you kind of have this network of people and all the military guys and women tend to live together kind of at the same place. When I was in Nashville, um, the, the base was right across the, the Kentucky line. And so exit one in Tennessee where I was, was nothing but military guys. The VBA I worked at was at like exit six and I chose to live it at exit 11 because I didn't want to live at exit one with all those other military people. I was going to stay where there were more civilian people, but military people tend to have this network. So if you're not going to live in the barracks, you're not going to live on base, you kind of have people helping you find housing. So for the first time, these guys may come out, women, 25, 30 years old, they've never rented an apartment before. They've never really had to find housing before. Doctors and insurance is the same way. You have TRICARE when you're in the military, your doctors are on base. So trying to decide how to get, where to get a doctor, how to find a doctor that qualifies with the insurance that you have, that's kind of a whole new territory for people coming out of the military. Um, again, leaving your workday, leaving the work incomplete, that can be more difficult. And there's a true loss of camaraderie and close friendships because military people are in the military together. If they're deployed together, they're a real small, intense group that works together. If they're just in the military and maybe not deployed, um, they all tend to live together or in the same place. So um, if they're on base or even if they're off base, it would kind of be like everybody at your workplace live in, in the same neighborhood. And think about where you live. How many people do you work with that live in your neighborhood? Military, it's kind of like all around you are people that you work with. So it's kind of a whole new world to be living around and being around people who aren't doing what you're doing every day. Reestablishing family roles, reconnecting with family. This can be difficult. This picture again is the ideal of what society thinks um, happens when people come back from deployment, the happy reunifications. My story when I think about this picture is that probably this guy's wife was pregnant while he or girlfriend was pregnant while he was away. She delivered the baby by herself while he was away. He comes back into the country 
And the likelihood that that baby is going to respond in that way is, is not really all that high. What may happen is that baby's going to scream at the top of its lungs because it doesn't know who that guy is because he's never seen that baby before and the baby's never seen him. So the guy is deployed in this picture and the whole time he's thinking about he can't wait to get back to be with his family and to meet his new kid. And when he meets the kid, the kid screams and is scared of him because doesn't know who he is. So the happy endings, how do you reestablish that role as the dad? The other kids have all kinds of anger and pain and feelings about their dad being away and then coming back. The wives have had to do everything while the guy is gone. And then the guy comes back and they have to find a way for him to fit back into the family. And it's the other way if it's the woman that was deployed. The woman's deployed, the man now becomes the, the person at home taking care of the kids, taking care of the cooking, the cleaning, the getting them to everything. And here comes this woman who wants to be the mom. I want my mom role back because that's what I was before I was deployed. And the dad now has that role. And it's really a big deal to try to help people reintegrate and reestablish those, those roles, how to maneuver again so that a, a man and a woman or a man and a man, a woman and a woman, how two people can live and work in the same household again and um, be a team. Um, veterans now have to have unassisted community adjustment. And um, another story that I like to tell about my, uh, my ex-husband is he said the only job he ever applied for was Kentucky Fried Chicken. He um, went in the Navy um, at 18 when he got out of high school and he worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken before that. When he got out of the Navy, he was sought after. So, so, that, so the headhunters grabbed him at that point and he never in his life applied for a job except Kentucky Fried Chicken and he's retired now. Um, Post-deployment job readjustment. Another story I like to tell is I had another friend in, um, in Alabama when I was living there and he was a banker. So he ran a bank. He went to work every day and he had on his white start shirt, his tie, his dark suit, his leather shoes, and he sat at the desk all day and he went to the country club in the evenings and he golfed and he played tennis and did social things. And then boom, he's deployed. He's now dressed in a, in a military uniform, fighting with the sand, not taking showers, living and working with um, the other men and women that are part of his unit. And that's a total readjustment. Then he comes back six months later and he's got to get back in that suit with the white shirt, with the tie, with the leather shoes, in the air conditioning, sitting at a desk all day. So the post and pre-deployment adjustment is really, um, it is a tough thing. It's a real thing. And it's our job to be sensitive to it and help people through it. And this, again, is another happy ending. That's what we want to see or what we think is going to happen is these men and women cannot wait to get back together again after a deployment. But what they find when they do get back together is that there's a lot of adjustment. There have been changes in the person deployed for six months, what they've seen, what they've done, who they've interacted with. And then the other person who's at home has had the same thing. Their life has gone on for six months plus. Um, and then they have to find a way to make their lives get together again. There's a loss of identity when you're no longer in the military. There's a loss of purpose. And when you're in the military, you're there to protect the country and to keep people alive. Um, and military people have a hard time and we need to be sensitive to, a lot of times people are thinking if they knew what I saw, if they knew what I had to do, they wouldn't accept me. So there's a lot of feeling that I don't wanna tell people what it was really like. And then the not fitting in. Um, People go into the military, they come back, let's say six. What happens in West Virginia is people go in the military and they leave for let's say 15, let's say they go the whole way to retirement, 20 years. They are traveling all over the United States. They are deployed, they are in foreign countries. They come back 20 years later and their friends that have lived here their whole lives. You know, you come back to West Virginia, you come back to your family and friends and they're not fitting in anymore. Their lives have been so different from the people that have lived in West Virginia all that time. And it takes a lot. They don't feel like they fit in. They can't find a way to fit in. Um, and it goes the other way. The people who have been in West Virginia the whole time don't really know what to talk to them about because everything that's familiar to them is something that the military person doesn't know anything about. Michelle, um, we have a few questions and comments okay. in the chat. Is, is, is it an okay time to take a break? Okay. and? 
Always an okay time, yes. Okay. Um, so the first one is specific about um, you know uh, resources, and they're asking if you have any suggestions for navigating Tricare for mental health treatment and addiction resources. Um. Probably, you know, it's. I think that it's. It is. You've got to find somebody who accepts Tricare. You're right. So I think that it's important for you, if you're working with military people, to probably get in touch with Tricare yourself and say, "Hey, who in this area accepts Tricare?" And then, if it were me, most military people want to work with someone who is military themselves. So I myself have a list of. Um, individual therapists for mental health and um, places where I know that a veteran can connect with someone who's been in the military. So some of it is just, you. I would use TRICARE, like I call a lot of insurance companies or have in the past and ask them, you know, who accepts their insurance. And the other thing that you can do is if you know you're gonna be working with um, people that are veterans, you can do some Googling yourself and look at who are the mental health providers in my area, which ones say on their websites that they are military or were, were military. So you kind of have to do some legwork yourself, I think. And, and the other question, this is from a little bit earlier in the presentation, but um, they're saying they are on the West Virginia state, uh, West Virginia, Virginia state line and wanted to know either the enrollment number for Virginia residents or is it possible to look up both? I guess that's enrollment for uh, the VA services. Oh, how to find the VA in your area? No, no, how the uh, enrollment number. Oh, yes, I guess that is the phone number for enrollment. Oh, the phone number. The, what you do is you just put in um, um, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and put in your town. Like if you're in, let's say, Fairfax, Virginia, um, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, Fairfax, Virginia, and the closest VA will come up. Okay. And if it doesn't, you can call any VA. Like if you called my VA here in Clarksburg and you asked, hey, here's where I'm living. Can you tell me what the VA, somebody will look that up for you. I can look that up for you. If you can't find it yourself, call me. I will gladly help you navigate how to find the closest VA. Great, and, and someone else was asking if you could share your list of mental health resources that accept TRICARE. That accept TRICARE? Yeah. I don't have a list that accepts TRICARE because I work at the VA. So I don't have a current list of what TRICARE accepts. So the best thing to do is to call TRICARE yourself. And just ask them who's, you know, who who takes who in my area takes um, Tricare. And then the last one was kind of a comment. Um, is back to when you were talking about, um, you know, uh, various things that are important to veteran culture, and, and they just commented, I think we should also acknowledge children of military members may also live by this culture. I have a coworker who really offended my husband, who's a son and a brother of a soldier, by not respecting the flag. Yes, definitely, definitely. My kids have grown up, yes. The kids are definitely in that same place, yes. Yes, because um, kids have sacrificed a lot when their parents are coming and going like that. And kids worry about whether their parents are gonna live through the experience. Yes. And that, that's it for, for questions. Okay. Now. Okay. I wanna get to this, I wanted to get to too, because this I love, I found this when I was um, kind of prepping for this. And it's just kind of a, a veteran wellness model and it kind of summarizes kind of how or what you can do to help veterans reintegrate. And if you look down the middle of this, if you're gonna to try to help a veteran with reintegration, think in terms of, I need to help them have a purpose. I need to make sure the material needs are met. I need to make sure their healthcare needs are met. And I need to make sure their social and personal relationship needs are met. So when we talk about purpose, we talk about what's their vocation. Um, you know, my son is 23, so he had a lot of friends that were in ROTC, probably because he was kind of military related himself. And as his friends were trying to decide what to do in the military, I would just beg them to choose an MOS because they were army that would, that would translate well into civilian life. And a lot of them didn't. They wanna be infantrymen or they wanna be these oddball things that don't translate well, you know, medical does, logistics does. Um, so when these people come out of the military, it's helping them, I'm not a military person anymore, what's my identity gonna be at work? Education, I put phase of life appropriate because um, people come out of the military 
very mature and very different than when they went in. So if you ask um, somebody who's, let's say they get out at 21 and you're gonna send them to a brick and mortar college with other 21 year olds who are sitting next to the keg, drinking beer, listening to music and partying on the weekends, this is not where a 21 year old who's been deployed a couple of times kind of is in their life. So think in terms of education, this phase of life appropriate. But that kind of covers the purpose if you can help people find vocation and find education. Material needs, financial legal stability, shelter, again, helping them find housing when it's not military related. You may have somebody who's 35 years old and has never rented an apartment before, depending on what they did in the military or had a house before. Um, and then access to goods and services, make sure they know how, you know, where's the grocery store that's not the commissary? You know, how do you find the stuff that you need? And this one I like, um, this one I kind of chuckled about because um, when I was in um, Alabama, I worked with a lot of younger guys and they were um, getting out, they were veterans at that point. Some of them were gonna be deployed again and kind of go back into the military. But they would talk about how um, I can't go into that state. And I would be, why can't you go into that state? There's a bench warrant out for my arrest. Why is there a bench warrant out for your arrest? Well, you know, I had these uh, these speeding tickets and I didn't pay them because I got deployed or I got moved to another um, state, another um, base in another state. I didn't get them paid before that. I didn't get to, get to go to court when I raised a ruckus and, you know, kind of had to go to jail for the night. I didn't go to my court date because I was in Iraq or I was in the next, you know, I was already stationed at the next station when my court date came up. So these guys would, um, I kind of heard that over and over again. Well, I have a bench warrant out for my arrest. And um, we have all kinds of stuff now where we can help people. We have VJO at the VA, um, which is Veterans Justice. And there's other legal entities that will help veterans with some of those issues. You know, there's nothing they could have done. They were deployed, but at the same time, they will be arrested if someone finds out that that's outstanding and they find out where they are. Um, mental health, physical health, access to health care, help veterans navigate that. Again, if you have difficulty, you can always call me. I'm more than willing to help you navigate that and find somebody that will work for the people, the veterans that you're working with or their families. Veteran wellness model, social relationships, family. We talked a lot about social network, spirituality. And I kind of... Um, Finding a tribe, I kind of put this at the end kind of as a fun little ending, but um, I try to work with the groups that I work with, the committees and coalitions. We work a lot on the basic stuff, making sure that people have food, water, shelter, employment, money coming in, because you don't, you, you have one less stressor against you and you're less likely to become suicidal if you have some of those things that aren't on your mind all the time. The other thing is that veterans feel isolated a lot of times. So if we can help get them engaged and involved in some of the organizations that are out there where they're with other veterans, I think it's helpful. So I kind of thought about it and listed some of them. There are a lot of motorcycle veterans clubs. So you can reach out to me, reach out to somebody, Google veteran motorcycle organizations in my area, um, and they should come up. And if not, get in touch with me. But a lot of um, military people, men and women, do ride motorcycles. And it's a good way for them to connect with each other. Healing waters is actually fly fishing. So, um, and it's really good for veterans with um, anxiety, PTSD, hypervigilance. You know, it's such a calming experience. So healing waters, it's called. It's throughout the state of West Virginia. I don't know if it's national or not, but a lot of veterans get involved in healing waters and seem to get a lot from it. Guitars for Vets is also in West Virginia. And those are groups of veterans who get together. You don't have to know how to play the guitar. They'll teach you how to play the guitar, but they'll do little entertainment for people. And they get together once a week and they learn to play and they practice together and they build um, friends, friendships in there. They have outdoor adventure groups. Um, I'm in another um, coalition with a guy who runs one of those things. And he's always taken these guys on like kayaking experiences and backpacking and hiking, but those are out there. We have two equine therapy programs in our area. Um, one is on Eagle's Wings, which is in Fairmont. The other is Stars and Strides, which is in Bridgeport. And they work with veterans um, and help again with some of their mental health issues and kind of give them an outlet. We have VFWs, we have American Legion. So we have all kinds of organizations. The other one that isn't on here is um, Hearts of Gold does service dogs for people. 
And then there's other dog organizations that will help veterans that want or need um, emotional support or service dogs. And I think that's about it. Um, victory is always possible for a person who refuses to stop fighting. And when you're working with veterans or anybody, I mean, if you keep getting up, you're not going to fail. And then not today is one of our suicide prevention uh, mottos that, you know, my goal is not today to keep you from dying by suicide today, one day at a time. And that's it. Any other questions? We're getting near the end of time, I think. We are. And thank you, uh, Michelle, for this great presentation. I'm just scrolling through to see if there's any additional questions before we finish up. Um, so um, I just want to note that I did post a link to today's evaluation survey in the chat for folks who have a moment to complete it. Um, if you don't have time today, we will um, we will send those out with your certificates. And I see there's a question about certificates. Those will get emailed out um, in the next week. So it'll take about a week. Um, and there was somebody who was asking if, Michelle, if you would be mind putting your contact information in the chat for everyone. Yeah, I don't mind. I'll do that. Okay. It's also on the first, if you pull up that um, PDF at the top, it's on the first slide. Okay, great. And we will be emailing out a copy of those PowerPoints, that PowerPoint to everyone after the seminar. And I just want to note, I know there were some issues with Zoom capacity. Apparently, we are only able to have 300 people on one of these seminars at the same time. And we've never had an issue of meeting more than that because we've never had so many people interested. So Michelle, you should be honored <laughs> that so many people interested. Um, so I apologize to the folks who either were not able to get on or got on and then got kicked off or, or and all of that. And, and most of you probably aren't even here if that's the case, but um, we will see if we can fix that in the future. But for those of you who are here, thank you very much. And thank you, Michelle, for for presenting. Um, as a note, next week's Launch and Learn is going to be for um, MSW and BSW students only. It's about resume and career building, so that's why there is not one next week, um, but we will be sending out an announcement for the next one that's open to community providers. So we're going to um, hang out, and um, I think um, Susan's working on putting her stuff in the chat, uh, but in the meantime, you can feel free to leave if, if you don't need that, And um, it, but we will keep this open for just a, a minute or two longer so folks can complete the survey and all that good stuff. So thank you for, for joining us, and thank you, Michelle, again, for that great presentation. You're welcome. Thanks.